Today's webinar will be conducted by Mr. Ramit Kapoor from IGI and the topic is Beyond the Forces. I am very thankful to Mr. Ramit Kapoor and IGI for organizing and conducting this webinar today for us. Now I hand over the presentation to Mr. Kapoor to take it for from here. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you to Gem Atlas. We've been uh, very regularly taking this keen initiative to take uh, thoughts and uh, the mindsets of the industry to all over, not only in India, but uh, across continents. So they're doing a great job by this webinar. Um, I believe more and more people are getting used to this concept of webinar. Compared to the earlier webinars, I think we've had some more attendees this time. So, so we're thankful to Gem Atlas. And also thankful to you, a very good afternoon to all those who've uh, been a part of this webinar, who've come, removed their valuable time to understand, to follow this presentation. Now the keen objective, the reason why we're doing uh, Beyond the Four Seas, the topic is, uh, I think there's something, webcam closed by organizer, it says. It's okay. So I hope we're live. It's okay. Are you still on? The organizer has stopped sharing your webcam. Okay. And uh, back. Sorry, I'm getting used to it too. All right. However, so the objective of this presentation is for everyone to come on a common platform to align ourselves so that we speak the same common language. Right? Uh, there are topics we've uh, we've taken a lot of topics. We're trying to just highlight and briefly talk about these uh, topics that we've actually picked out. They concern uh, diamond tears, jewelers. So these topics would, or the points that we discuss here, would rather benefit across the industry. Right. So let's see what's the agenda for today. Uh, we will talk about the impact of the relief of inclusions on the clarity grade of the diamond. Clarity enhancements. The last time we did. Uh, we spoke about clarity enhancements, uh, we picked up fracture filling. This time we talked about internal laser drilling which is also a concern with the lower clarity stones that we see. Color, when we talk about color, uh, we'll talk specifically about the tinge and nuance, uh, the tinges, the different colors that you see in, in a diamond. Uh, uh, so we'll briefly touch base on that. We we'll talk about the finish grade and when we speak about the finish grade, the topic that will be picked up will be symmetry. So polish and cut grade is uh, something which uh, we've all achieved and wonders at. However, symmetry, we still see a, some part of the manufacturers lacking in this area which we'll discuss here. Uh, hearts and arrows, getting more and more uh, popular across the globe across India too. So how do you achieve hearts and arrows? What passes, what fails is what we touch base. And finally the topic that everyone is discussing is lab grown diamonds. However, we talk about how IGI offers the services here. Right? So let's talk about clarity grade. And when we talk about clarity grade, what we're not really going to talk about is we, how do you get a BBS1, BBS2, but we are going to discuss relief of inclusions. Right? So we all are aware of the five parameters which influence or are responsible for the clarity grade of the diamond. The nature of the inclusion, the size of the inclusion, the position of the inclusion, the number of the inclusion, and the relief of the inclusion. So when we're talking about VBS, VS, the parameters like the position of the inclusion or the size of the inclusion makes a makes a big impact on the grade. But here we're talking about lower grades like SI, I1 grades, where 
the relief of the inclusion makes a big difference. So here we want to uh, clarify certain areas how IGI would create a stone between an SI2 and an I1. Uh, by, so let's see a few pictures here of uh, a few stones. Looking at what we see on our screen, so we see uh, a near colorless stone with a lot of feathers in there. However, the feathers that we see are very well spread. Uh, they're not going to make a huge impact to the naked eye and will be almost difficult to notice with the naked eye. So though the stone is heavily included, the way the inclusions are spread would nominate the stone to be rather an SI2 compared to an I1. We move to another stone. Here also you see large inclusions. Again, they're very well spread. There's a lot of light return. Uh, these inclusions would be difficult to somewhat easy to see with the naked eye. However, the impact or the relief of these inclusions are very low to downgrade it to I1. So these kind of inclusions as they're spread well, not blocking light, the relief is low, would, uh, would get an SI2. Let's move to another stone, which we see out here is an I1, clarity. So what you clearly see is at 12 o'clock a huge fracture feather. So the relief is very high and um, easily noticeable with the naked eye. Even if you see at 6 o'clock the, the, uh, the, the feather is, the relief is very high and it's blocking light there. So these kind of stones, though the inclusions are more on the ground, not on the table, however the size or the relief of the inclusion rather would downgrade it to I1. We move to another stone here on the screen. Again, at the 12 o'clock position, you see a huge fracture feather. Feather with the fracture, blocking light. Again, bringing this down to I1. So here we discussed, we looked at a few stones just to understand clearly the relief of the inclusion and what we would bring down or downgrade to an I1 or uh, grade as an I1 compared to stones where the relief is lower or nicer for it to uh, get an SI2 grade, right? So let's move to the next topic here. So these are short topics. We threw as much as light. What we want is uh, towards the end of, you can note down your questions towards the end of the presentations. Uh, presentation, I'll be able to take these questions and I'll be answering them pertaining to that topic. Clarity enhancement. So, um, most commonly, uh, fracture filling as well as laser drilling. Uh, these are the two common uh, ways how they would enhance the clarity of a diamond. Uh, fracture filling, though, uh, being a temporary uh, enhancement. Okay, it's not uh, permanent. However, laser drilling is a permanent enhancement, which is we why we mention it on the report. So the last time we spoke about external laser drills, uh, however, this time we talk, talk about internal laser drill, also known as the KM treatment or also known as Kidua Meiwa treatment, right? Internal laser drill, that's what it means. So on the screen, the stone that you see is actually not an internal laser drill, but this is how an external laser drill stone looks like. You can clearly see the channel starting from the surface and they're reaching the inclusion. So making like this pipe or this uh, edge channels that uh, would reach the uh, dark included crystal how, and then the stone is boiled and the uh, inclusion is bleached and what you see out here finally is a more white colorless, uh, near colorless inclusion, not completely I would say uh, transparent but white and not a dark included. Now let's look at this particular inclusion here. Uh, so this is under a very high end uh, magnification, I would say about 50 to 60x. At 10x, they look like feathers with dark included crystal. However, that's not what it is. What we see out here is um, an internal laser drill. Again, it's a laser drill which starts from the surface. However, it's not really making a uh, drill hole on the surface, but what it's, what it's doing is it's creating a small feather on the surface. 
So when you loop it uh, at a 10 power magnification, at a lower magnification on the microscope, what you see is a, surf a feather created on the surface and then it's, it's uh, you can say, connected to a larger feather, right? So it's an illusion which is created that it's not a drill but just a regular feather. However, if you closely look at the inclusion, it, it is very peculiar making like a laser drill or a laser mark in the stone. Let me show a few more images or a few more stones here. Here also you can see the drill uh, along with the fracture. So they're always along with the fracture and they try to and they reach the dark included crystal. So a small opening is made on the surface but not a hole but just like a small feather and then uh, when the stone is boiled, uh, the, st uh, the dark inclusion gets bleached through these feathers which are created. Another stone, uh, very similar, so under the microscope it looks like this, but at a 10, uh, 10x loop, it would rather look like a feather to you, which you would create as an SI or an I1 stone. However, when IGI, when stones are submitted to IGI and you encounter stones like these, we mention in the comments that uh, stone uh, shows internal laser drill present. So the statement in comments says internal laser drill present, right? So that's the disclosure that we do. Again, you see the laser drill here. You see, so very peculiar centipede-like inclusions that you can see and with feathers along with them, right? So. Uh, it makes sense to uh, invest in a good microscope in order to see these kind of inclusions. So that was uh, uh, briefly talking about enhancements where we spoke about internal laser drill. Uh, when we move to color grading, so that was more of clarity uh, grading, clarity enhancement, we move to color grading, we talk about tinge and nuance, right? So when we talk about tinge and nuance, what you see on the screen are stones which start from the colorless range, uh, moving to near colorless uh, on the top, as you see, and getting to slightly tinted, darker colors as you move on. And at the bottom, you can see to the extreme right, uh, fancy colors also. Mostly what you see out here are the stones which show the yellow, uh, yellow color range and which is taken as standard. Uh, here also you see on the screen a stone, a colorless stone or more like a G color compared to another near colorless or slightly tinted stone there. Again, in the yellow range. However, what do we call as a tinge or a nuance? Right? So, uh, when there's a faint presence of another color, like other than yellow, if you have another color, uh, is termed as a tinge or a nuance in color grading. Like we could uh, have stones which are near colorless, however, like a G or an H uh, stone or an I color stone, however, the stone is not yellow in color, but the body color is more like blue. So we would mention the alphabet as, for example, the color is H, and also mention it comments or at the, uh, you know, in the field of color as faint blue. It could also happen that we mention a color K with faint green. Uh, as it goes down, it gets, uh, there are times we do not even, below K or L, we do not even mention the, the alphabet with the rather right light green or uh, green, that's what uh, would be mentioned, right? So, Okay, let's take a look at this stone. So if you look at this stone, it looks like a colorless stone. Uh, it does have a little bluish nuance or a tinge to it, right? So this kind of a stone would uh, probably get a color grade like G or H uh, and mention faint blue, right? So that's, it's more like a faint blue nuance that you see there. So similar way you have stones which would have light green, light brown, right? So these kind of, uh, if you've seen mentioned on IGI reports, the reason why we would do that is 
the body color is more dominant of another color other than yellow. So when we're talking about nuances and colors, we'll also move to another topic which is very correlated is fancy colors, right? And when we determine the color, when we say that the stone is a natural fancy pink or a natural fancy deep green, what are we looking at? We're looking at uh, three parameters here, the hue or the body color of the stone, the tone, whether it's light or dark, and saturation, whether how vivid the color is, is it bright or is it dull or deep, is what we're looking at. So we look at a few fancy colors, a few rare stones that we've uh, encountered in the lab, like uh, what you see out here is a natural fancy intense yellow, uh, again, these kind of uh, loose stones, I would say, and jewelry pieces do come into the lab. Um, more in the trade terms that they use for the stone set in the ring is more like a cognac. However, uh, we would uh, call it like a yellowish brown uh, or an orangey brown color stone there. All right. Uh, so let's quickly look at these stones. These uh, are very nice, rare, uh, intense, natural fancy, intense green. Uh, you have natural fancy, intense bluish greens. You have, so you have, wow, that's a good variety of pinks from natural fancy, intense, vivid to natural fancy, deep. So the moment uh, the saturation is not so high. It's a little dull, so we would uh, nominate that stone as a deep uh, color rather than an, a vivid or an intense. Right? So you have a natural fancy, more of reddish pink, natural fancy orangey yellows. Uh, yeah, so now you, now, now we see from vivids to intense, now we have stones. On the right hand side you can see a natural fancy deep or so we say deep because it's the saturation is not so bright. Uh, so we call it a natural fancy deep uh, orangey brown. Yeah, that's what we would call that. And the natural fancy black. So I hope this uh, this collection of stones or images clears up a lot about how fancy colors are graded in, uh, at the IGL lab. So when we're done with color, let's move to the finish grade or the cut grade or I would say when we say the finish grade of the diamond, uh, it's made up of three parameters here, the polish grade, the symmetry grade and the cut grade, right? When we're talking about polish, we're talking about external blemishes on the stone, which uh, most of the stones that we see in the industry today do get an excellent polish. However, stones which uh, stones like uh, uh, cut grade, okay, sorry. So talking about cut grade, so there are parameters. There are these set parameters that you need to follow based on the table percentage, crown angle, crown height, the pavilion depth, the girdle thickness, and then you know whether the stone is excellent, very good, good affair. Uh, symmetry, so symmetry is something that no matter how, uh, how far we've reached with our cutting standards, it's still a challenge for a lot of manufacturers. We do achieve the excellent polish, the excellent cut grade, but at times we lack and we would when a stone is uh, submitted, it gets like a very good symmetry, not excellent. So key areas to look in symmetry are the stone needs to be round. If the stone is out of round due to certain reasons like the unnatural, which is actually uh, uh, pressing into the stone and the entire circumference of the stone looks it like it's a little dent on the stone. It's does not completely round or an extra facet that has been pushed in would bring it down to a very good grade. Uh, so, so out of round is a challenge that we, we're still encountering, but mostly what we see is 
these this happens really when uh, the stone is of a magic weight like 1.00 carat or 1.50 or 2.00 so to get that magic weight the manufacturer tries to get the maximum diameter and in a, in order to achieve that he uh, will compromise on the beauty of the stone and slightly goes out of round so what on screen that we see out here is beautiful excellent polish excellent symmetry and an excellent cut grade so when you get a triple excellent, uh, fairly you're looking at a more beautiful stone, showing a lot of light return, everything in place, and that's what you pay for. Uh, what do you see? Alternatively, you see a stone out here where the, the, uh, the facets or the star facets are irregular, the stone has, the table is slightly off-centered, which we would bring down to a very good out here what do you see? You see the pavilion mains, they're supposed to be ending in a point. However, they're not ending in a point and they are left open. If you look at the picture at the bottom, you can closely see the, uh, the pavilion main, it reaches the girdle and instead of meeting at a point, it's slightly left open. This is what we term as an open facet and it would bring the grade down to, to, very, to, very, to very good. Of, uh, sorry, and uh, what do we see here? Alignment, right? So this is also a symmetry uh, variation that is most commonly uh, ignored by a few manufacturers, where the facets from the crown need to be aligned with the facets in the pavilion. If they are not aligned and slightly misaligned, we would bring the grade down to VG. Now a lot of this, uh, the grading at IGI is done a lot based on the visual appearance of the stone. So probably your numbers might match somewhere of your twist and your alignment. However, visually if we see that the stone is slightly out of round or the stone, the alignment is slightly off uh, at a few facets, we would bring the grade down to VG, right? Hot scenarios, right? So we're moving towards uh, uh, the final part of the presentation that talking about hot scenarios. So what are hot scenarios? Are these seen only in round cut, uh, round brilliant cuts? No, we also see the hot scenarios effect in cushions, in uh, Octagon cuts, square radians, right? So it's the so the this effect is seen in other cuts too. What do we see when when look through a filter or a uh, we would say a heart and arrow viewer? Well, from the table up. So when you see a stone from the table up through the viewer, you will see eight arrows. The arrow effect, as you see on the screen, on the top we've shown you a more uh, visual image of it but as, as seen below the image is more of what really what it looks like. So if you see the right hand side image it shows you eight pavilion means that look like arrows. This is when you are looking at a stone from face up view and when you uh, flip the stone so that the table is down and the lid is up you're looking through the pavilion from the top you would look at eight uh, hearts. So what you see on the left hand side are the images that are of hearts, right? So do all round show this? Do all round brilliant show this? Somewhere, yes, all most of your round brilliants today because they're cut very well would show some amount of heart scenarios. But to get a report or to get your stone to be passed in heart scenarios, there are certain areas that we need to look at which we will look through as the presentation moves on. How do you achieve hard scenarios? So let's look at the image on the top on the left hand side. What you see out here is the, the angles or the vertical angles which are very well responsible to achieve the hard scenarios. Right? So when I'm talking, talking about the 
the vertical angles, I'm talking about the crown angles, the pavilion angle, the crown height. Uh, so these are more of your vertical angles. Look at the image at the bottom. So that is actually showing you the horizontal angles. All right. So that's actually the key to achieve hearts and arrows. Not your, not really your vertical angles, but your horizontal angles, which we also call it as the angle of tilt or the azimuth. All right, so that's your facets. So what happens is the manufacturer needs to be very careful when he's polishing all the horizontal or the facets should be aligned in the same angles. If there is, if, a, if he presses too much and if you, if there's a stone where the facet gets pressed too much, it changes the horizontal angle and it affects the heart and arrow image when seen under the viewer. So what do you need to achieve a heart and arrow or to get a stone for heart and arrow? So these are guidelines, not really uh, uh, the exact numbers that you really need to follow. However, these are guidelines if you have a table between 55 to 57% and your crown angle. Crown. So these are your vertical angles that you need to achieve. right? Other than that, if you get your horizontal angles in place, you will achieve a perfect heart scenario. So as you see, symmetry is, is the key here. Now let's look at a few stones here. What's happening out here is you have uh, to your left hand side, you have a stone where, uh, so we're looking at only the hearts, the image of the hearts. And what you see out here is one of the hearts is of a smaller size compared to the others, right? So it's very important that all the eight hearts should be of the same size. If you look at the image in the center, you can see that it's of the heart that is circled is very similar to in size. However, the shape is not the same as the other hearts. So it's not only the size, but also the shape of the, uh, of the heart that's very important. If we uh, look at the other images, again, look, let's look at the lower left-hand side image. If you have an inclusion, so it's possible that we can give hearts and arrows even in an SI stone. It doesn't have to be VBS or VS. SI stones also can get uh, hearts and arrows. Now it's, it, it's how the inclusion should not, uh, you can say, impact or cut off the outline of the image. So if you look at the lower image here, you can see the, the outline is being cut off. You cannot really see the outline of the hearts. So at some certain areas, the outline is cut and that affects uh, the heart and arrow and this would fail, this stone would fail. Though it shows eight hearts, but though they are not perfectly uh, seen here, it would fail. Again, the lower right hand side, you see uh, eight hearts again and if you see the cleft, is too deep. So if the cleft of the heart is too deep, again, this would, uh, the stone would fail for hearts and arrows. Exactly above that is a stone where if you closely look, just next to the image of the heart, there is a smaller, a smaller V-shaped uh, image that you see just right next to the heart, right? So all eight hearts have this V-shaped uh, image right below it. Now the, there should be a gap between the heart and the V-shaped formation. If they are joined, there is no gap seen, that stone also fails. So let's see now what pass is. Right, there you go. So that's a, that's a stone that would pass for hearts and arrows, actually only for hearts because we still have to look at the arrows. So you see the shape of the uh, the shape of the hearts are perfect. The V shape of uh, formation is very nice there. Uh, and uh, yes, that passes. Yeah. What happens in this case? So you see out here, the moment you uh, play with the symmetry of the stone. So as, as you notice out here, there's a variation in the girdle, though it is thin to slightly thick, but however, it's slightly wavy as the girdle has been pushed in that area. And you can see a direct impact on the heart 
image there. So this particular stone fails. You see one of the heart looks like it's missing. It's not seen there, right? So symmetry is vital for the perfect heart scenario. So symmetry has to be achieved. It's possible that a stone with a cut grade of VG could get hearts and arrows as long as you've achieved the right symmetry for it. Moving to the arrows, so let's quickly look at the arrows. You see the image on the top, you see on the left hand side, a poorly formed arrow. So the arrows are not formed well. The stone in the center again shows inclusions which are cutting off certain uh, outlines of those arrows. On the right hand side you see there is a slight misalignment. So the, the arrow is made up of two parts. The bottom part is called the shaft and the top is called the head. So the shaft and the, he uh, the, shaft and the head need to be perfectly aligned. If they are slightly misaligned this stone also fails for hearts and arrows. Right? So you can see the arrows are failing here. That's, that's a stone that passes. So if you closely look, this stone is also has inclusions in it, but none of the inclusion is actually breaking the outline of the arrow. The arrows look intact, nice, beautiful, and the inclusions are more within the arrows, so this passes for arrows, right? Finally, if your stone passes for hearts and arrows, IGI issues you a special hearts and arrows diamond report. Uh, so it's more like a premium report that you have. So you can take it for, if the stone is a one carat plus, you can take larger. Uh, at the bottom you see we also have the uh, diamond identification report with the heart and arrow image. So for smaller stones like your below a carat, you can also submit stones to get the dossier style or the dossier type report. I hope I've thrown enough light on certain topics. Uh, lab grown diamonds, right? So everyone's talking about them. We've heard a lot about them. I'm sure all of you all are very updated on this. Today we're going to talk more on the screening services that IGI provides for lab grounds, right? So when stones or parcels are submitted to IGI for lab grown identification, it goes through a series and a combination of tests, whether it would be in a parcel, loose stones, single stones, or even mounted jewelry. When uh, jewelry is submitted, we also screen the jewelry to identify whether it has any presence of or absence of lab grown diamonds. So on the screen you see not only various tests being conducted, but certain parcels that we found. At the bottom right hand side is very unique. This is a parcel which has approximately 8,000 stones. And we separated, you see that little white dot there right next to it? So you see that parcel white with the colorless diamonds? Yeah? It's not working. So the mouse is not working where I cannot point out. However, if you look at the bottom at the white parcel, you see a tiny dot right next to it in white. So that's actually a minus two uh, size diamond that we've actually separated out from that parcel. I mean, I, this took quite a while, probably a day to do this. However, it's possible. So when stones are submitted or parcels at IGI, it goes through various tests, jewelry, as well and uh, we're able to identify and tell you whether it, the parcel shows presence or absence of lab grown. Uh, there are stones which we would mark in jewelry which need further tests which you can unmount and we can tell you whether they're lab grown or you can just replace them with a parcel which is natural. Right? So all these services are provided and uh, the turnaround time is faster. At one point of time, we had the complaint that, wow, you know, it takes about um, 10 days to two weeks to get your parcel back. However, the turnaround time is now three working days, and your parcel can be turned around in, uh, I just got someone putting his hand up saying not three, but four. 
Okay, so three to four working days is what your parcel can come back uh, with. So there, so this is how we return it. What we do is we would either give your parcel back saying there is absence of lab bones, so these are natural diamonds. Secondly, the uh, we could also have a mixed parcel which has uh, a lot of quantity. I would say the proportion of lab grown in that is is a lot for us to really and not even worthwhile for you to separate out when the proportion is too much. So we would give it out as a mixed parcel. However, we also do the service where we can actually, if a few stones are contaminating a natural diamond parcel, we can pull them out and give it to you separately as either lab grown or refer for further tests. And the natural parcel gets a, a absence of lab grown uh, report on it, right? The same can be done for mounted jewelry, right? So yes, uh, uh, at this point of time, we are much ahead of the lab grown producers in terms of identification. And uh, yes, the industry is taking a lot of correction. Uh, we, we see a lot of lower intakes of uh, parcels which have lab grown now at IGI as well as the contamination which was very heavy, we do not see much of contamination. So the industry has taken a lot of corrective actions for this and we're glad that we are all uh, combated this issue of lab growth, right? So what we do is uh, you can contact IGI, we can help you to understand better how you should submit your parcels. If you're making jewelry, probably like you're buying two, three hundred carats of minus two or stars, you don't need to submit everything. I think safely about 10% of your minus two, if you take a cut and submit it, based on those results at IGI, you can take a decision whether you want to buy the parcel or you want to reject the parcel, right? And uh, the pricing that we, uh, so we brought down our pricing quite a lot because uh, I think it is, it is, uh, very vital for every manufacturer who's making jewelry or trading in uh, star Mary loose diamonds to have a sparsal screen. So the pricing is actually even uh, you can see with, uh, with the sizable number of submission you can get pricing at about 300 rupees a carat also. So that should not really bother you because at 300 rupees a carat you can take a decision on a larger parcel and uh, the logistics work that way. I thank you for your time and uh, patient hearing. I'll be ready to take any questions if there are any. So there are. So questions. So can you help me with this? So, uh, so the questions are not showing up on my screen, however, we will address your questions. Alright, so we'll start with uh, Vipul. Vipul says hi, so hi Vipul, you don't have a question yet, but uh, hi to you. Right. How can diamonds be compared? Neville, right? So, Neville, yes, diamonds can be compared with reference stones or master stones that you can make for yourself. What you can do is you can, uh, you can submit a few stones of uh, sizes which are more that you work with. For example, you're working with a carat plus stones, all right? That's what your inventory is more like. You can su submit about 50 to 70 pointers to IGI. Uh, however, we have certain conditions uh, uh, that you need to follow uh, before you submit stones and we can try to help you to make certain reference stones which will help you uh, make your buying and sales better. Right? So they need to be compared to natural diamonds most preferably. Right? And uh, 
when you're talking about how can they be compared, they should be, if they're talking about round brilliance, they should be compared from the pavilion side and not really the face up view. So from the pavilion view through the bellies, uh, keeping a little distance between the two stones is how you would compare these stones, right? You can follow the course, you know. I, mean, I would promote the course. Uh, it gives you hands-on hands -on experience on how diamonds can be grading. And trust me, uh, because it's practical, it will definitely help you uh, in your business. So the next question is, who will evaluate them? How can they be compared and who will evaluate them? So I'm a little lost here. Uh, who will evaluate them? We. So when they're submitted to IGI, we would evaluate them with a team of experts who would be evaluating your stone. What is your take on slight, intense, natural, fancy pink diamond? Slight, intense, natural, fancy pink diamond. Wow. So uh, my, my uh, technical team is will or the research team could take that question better because for me I don't really understand the term slight intense natural. So I've heard of natural intense, uh, natural fancy intense pink or natural fancy vivid pink or deep or light pink but not slight. That terminology is not really what IGI uses. Uh, does drilled laser or feather reduce the durability or strengthness of the stone? So Neville has another question, yeah, so that's good. So he says, uh, does the drill, oh, so that's by Yogesh, or, okay, Yogesh, I'll take your question, sorry. So does the drill laser or feather reduce the durability of the stone? Uh, the, so what happens is, so a small feather is created which also uh, they're actually trying to piggyback on a larger feather all right, so a small feather on a larger feather is created which reaches the actual inclusion which needs to be bleached. So yes, it could impact the durability when the laser is being done. So you know, when the laser is being done, sometimes you could have a feather which could expand or it could larger, it could crack. So all these things, so it's always a risk. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a risk at all times. Uh, when you're doing this kind of uh, enhancement, right? Sorry. All right. So next, are the are there chances of color changing of good which have been treated? Uh, yes. Uh, with the latest or with the current uh, treatments that exist, HPHD, there are chan there are absolutely no chances of the color being reversed, all right? So it remains the same. However, if it's heat treated and other very low radiation, there could be a possible that the color could change, but uh, depends on the treatment or the style of treatment that has been done on the stone, all right? Why is the hearts and arrows aspect of the stone so important as portrayed? Uh, okay, so it's nice. Um, it's nice to look at. It also, when we talk about the hearts and arrows, it's beautiful to see actual, when we're talking about diamonds, we're talking about beauty, we're talking about love, how well to connect it, rather the best way would be the heart and the arrow, right? The Cupid way of connecting to it. More to it, the technical way to it is the hearts and arrows are achieved when the stone is cut to very high high symmetry standards. So uh, that makes it very, very important as the aspect when you ask me uh, why is it so important or that aspect, it, it, it reflects directly on the symmetry of the stone. So how does the hearts and arrows look in diamonds? Uh, so that question, earlier question was by Sarla, thank you for asking. Uh, Praveen, Praveen Miranda, how does hearts and arrows look in diamonds other than RBC? Very similar, right? So they could look very similar, right? So if it's a 57 octagon or a eight sided faceted uh, facet stone, octagon brilliant, uh, the, the bezels would show you uh, 
the arrows and the, from the pavilion you would see the hearts. However, in modified, uh, modified brilliant cuts, it would slightly, as the number of facets increase, the images would increase more. So it no longer would be just eight hearts and arrows, probably it could be 12 or 16 hearts and arrows uh, images that you see. So, Sanket, uh, your question is, how do you deal with stones with tinge? So, firstly, uh, we have to determine when we see the stone, the color grader looks at the stone. Uh, he looks at the stone for the body color. So, if it's a color other than yellow, then at that point of time, we would determine that the stone has a tinge. Now, how much is the tinge? For example, there are stones which are uh, which are yellowish green, right? Or greenish yellow. So the moment if the yellow is dominant, we do not mention that it has a faint green or a faint yellow green, right? The because yellow is more dominant. However, when the stone is more dominant green, so like a yellowish green, if the green is very dominant, at that point of time we would mention as faint yellow green. And if it's a color which is K or below, we would just mention faint yellow green. However, if the stone is like G H I I color, probably we would mention the alphabet and faint yellow green in comments. Do people look as closely to hearts and arrows in diamond jewelry? If yes, so when it is in diamond jewelry, when it's set in the jewelry, you don't really see the hearts because the pavilion is below you, you just see the arrows right so you would just see arrows and but uh, yeah it's more popular in loose stones and in larger stones rather rather than star and melee jewelry so if you have bigger sizes like 30 points and above you can also see when the, it's an open set ring or a earring if you put the viewer you can see the arrow image very well right. so that question was by your gauge. Uh, do you give the color better or you downgrade? Is a question from Sanket. So I'll try to relate it to your question uh, where it has a tinge. No, so the tinge or the body color has got nothing to do with the amount of color. So when we give a color, for example, uh, faint for a color like uh, maybe J, faint green, the alphabet J is given equivalent to a yellow tinge stone. So if it had a yellow also, it would get J because that is the amount of color. So the amount of color determines the color grade and the body color determines the tinge. So they would be graded at par, right? Penifo, uh, right? Is it possible for lab-grown diamond technology to improve to a point where it's not possible to tell the difference between natural and lab-grown? We cannot comment much on technology. Currently, we know and we understand that we are not only at par, but a step ahead in identification, right? But yes, technology changes the way stones uh, change the production style, the way the the growth structure or the inclusion pattern, all that can change with time. But what happens is what it leaves behind is a fingerprint, right? Anything which is synthesized would leave a fingerprint behind which would help us to identify that this is a lab-grown diamond. So currently, uh, let's be rest assured, the major labs are doing their job. In clarity, so that's from Latish. In clarity enhanced goods, is it possible for the clarity to return to its natural uh, one with time or is it permanent? All right. So like I mentioned earlier, there are two types of enhancements. There is fracture filling, which is not permanent. So yes, with time, it's possible as the filling comes out, the stone would resume its original uh, uh, appearance, how it is, or the clarity. However, in uh, what we would see in laser drilling, it's more of a permanent. So it's not that, so it's a permanent process. It will not reverse. And once the drill is in there, uh, that inclusion is created and will remain always. Right. 
Sarla again, what would you advise to manufacturers for having a perfect hearts and arrows? So what I just mentioned is you need to, a few key points, your parameters, your cut grade in place, uh, more important, not only your vertical angles, but I would stress upon your horizontal or your angles of your facets, the azimuth angles that we're talking about. That needs to be uh, taken most care of and you will achieve the hearts and arrows. Right? Mr. Bunser says hello. Uh, he says need to know about the symmetry feature. I just wanted to know what you see basically in checking the symmetry of the stone. Our high technology serene machines as well as strained eyes show excellent but IGI would still give it. So yes, like I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, a stone uh, for the diameter. For example, the diameter is from 6.53 mm to 6.62 mm, right? Or 6.60 mm, right? So the variation in the diameter is not too much, right? However, this can be manipulated. Why? Because, for example, the stone is uh, pressed or is a little uh, out of round from one area, you can compensate it by uh, match creating uh, or getting the right diameter by pressing it from the other side too, right? So the all that can be manipulated. So though the serene or other equipment might show that the stone is within the excellent symmetry, Finally, the visual look also does matter because that's how the consumer would perceive it from the face up. So when IGI would grade certain stones like this, it's, uh, they would see a lot on the visual, not forgetting that we also look at the, the numbers, the symmetry numbers, but the overall final grade is based on the, the visual face up appearance of the stone. Can you please show any images of hearts and arrows other than RBC? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I can uh, mail it to you if you share your email ID. I can share with you a few pictures. At the moment, the presentation does not have these images. But if you share your email ID, we could mail you some images of other uh, shapes. So that's from Sanket again. Uh, Darshan. What does IGI do if a stone is considered as an SI3 in the market? Do you downgrade or upgrade the clarity? So, <laughs> all right, so SI3 is more like a term which is used in the trade to bridge the gap between SI2 and I1. So there are these stones which probably would not fit either or at that moment you're debating. So then uh, it is termed based on price rather than the grade. So based on price, it is termed as an SI3. But for IGI, like I said, if the inclusions, the relief is not too large, if the relief is not too heavy, and the inclusions are spread, so there are stones in the market which are termed as SI3, which we would grade as SI2. And in the trade, stones of SI3 that we would give based to I1. So it's actually how the inclusion really affects the durability or the light blockage of the stone. Sanket, why has IGI become so harsh in the cut grade? Sanket, you got to meet me. Uh, probably there is some variation because cut grade is by numbers. So we cannot really become strict in a cut grade. Okay, So we are following this chart and these numbers that the industry follows. And it's been there for a while now. Right? It's been there for years now. So if there is something in your mind, uh, which is a confusion, uh, probably crown height, which you mentioned, you should visit IGR, send us a mail, and we'll be able to clarify that for you. All right. So the questions keep pouring in from Sanket again. Hi, Sanket. Sanket, so we need to meet up. I see most of the questions are from you, right? So I get your email ID, and I will uh, definitely please send me a mail at ramit at igiworldwide.com, and we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Darshan, what is the difference with the lab-grown diamonds and natural in jewelry? So, so there's no, 
so a synthetic or a lab grown diamond whether it's loose or in jewelry is the same it's just the identification process done by IGI is different, right? So there's a set of different equipment that we use, which most of our labs across the country are equipped with, and they will be from, so the basic equipment is everywhere. However, some at some point you need further tests, and that kind of equipment is at a few locations like the Surat or the Mumbai branch, which you, uh, which can identify to a certain uh, other level or extent. Right? But it's the same, it's just the how we would uh, identify is different. I believe that the questions are over. If, uh, like I said again, if there are any other questions that you have, uh, please send, send us an email or you can send me an email at ramit.igi worldwide and we'll be more than happy to answer and we could meet you in person also, look at a few stones of yours to clarify certain doubts. So I hope uh, this interaction has been fruitful. We'll be always part of this initiative to have some more clarity on certain doubts in the mind of the trade, right? So we, like I said, it's the same platform, common language that we all need to speak. So with that note, uh, I'll thank all of you and thank you uh, from Team IGI and for being a part of the presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody for being uh, so attentive and attending.